So let's go on and talk about inflammatory changes of the cervical spine. Uh, here you go, Sam, what do you think of this case? There's some, oh, okay. There's some thickening posterior to the dense and some narrowing. This is a 74-year-old person. It's a narrowing of the canal at that level. And I think it's like... Yeah, severe. Yeah, I mean, this, this could be like synovial thickening. Mm -hmm. um, rheumatoid could look like this. And rheumatoid, this is, I guess, non-enhanced, right? So it can calcify too. Um, synovial, chronic synovial processes in this region can calcify. Uh -huh. Right. Um, yeah, this, I forget the name of it. There's. Um, the name of it. Yeah, so yeah. this is uh, CPPD disease. Uh, uh, again, as we've discussed this, you know, what is CPPD disease? It's really calcium pyrophosphate deposition into tissues, uh, and whether it's actually a disease itself or whether that's just <laughs> the response that some tissues have when you have <coughs> uh, either chronic inflammatory changes or post-traumatic changes. Uh, is something that a lot of people debate. Uh, this is also called a, a retroodontoid pseudotumor in this case. So uh, most people just call it CPPD disease uh, as if that's an independent disease in its own in its own state. Uh, here's, a, here's another example of uh, you have calcifications here. Uh, uh, when you have a lot of uh, soft tissue like this that calcifies, it's also called the uh, crown dim syndrome, which we talked about. Again, I think there are a lot of names for diseases, and it's not clear uh, whether there are different diseases or uh, really. Uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, uh, this can compress the cord at this location, and you have to think about anything that can produce chronic soft tissue thickening, which can then become calcified in this area. And this patient's probably had a lot of, a lot of trauma and chance of things associated with, uh, with it. Okay. Let's see, here's another X-ray. Okay. So I'm looking at the C2 region, C1, C2 region. Looks like maybe there's some widening between the. Yep, right in there. Mm-hmm. skeptical of seeing a lot of these things on plain radiographs. Now, this is a patient who actually had rheumatoid arthritis in this area. In the MR scan. Yeah, it looks like there's panis formation and synovial thickening. Here you can see the panis. You can see some erosive changes anteriorly there. Synovitis. Similar, it's enhancing, yeah. And this is rheumatoid arthritis. So, two uh, sagittal images again, uh, lots of abnormal signal along the dense. Okay, so, this dense is very abnormal. Right. Loss of fat on the T1, e erosions the there. Right. Rheumatic too. Right. Rheumatic too. No, you can't determine that on an MRI line. But the calcification is something you can see on an X ray based technique, but the the calcification itself is relatively unimportant. There are a lot of diseases, like uh, which we've talked about in the shoulder and so forth, uh, which we made in the past, or even uh, Sagan fracture of the knee, which were important when you only had x-rays to make a diagnosis. But the reason you want to look for a Sagan fracture is that it's highly associated with an ACL tear. Now with MR, we can actually see the real disease and try to infer disease from just some calcification. This isn't something we have to do anymore. 
So, so like, I, I guess the would be different if this were to it versus most traumatic or intense or something. Yeah. And uh, yeah, typically you won't get calcification with rheumatoid, but it's not useful enough to be helpful in the differential diagnosis. Okay, uh, Sahara, what do you think of this one? Okay, 92 year old female with left sided weakness and numbness after a fall. Again, we see panic formation around the dance process, erosion of the dance with a uh, significant mass effect on the cord and narrowing of the canal. So, it looks like another rheumatoid. Yeah, there is like signal in the cord also. And it's funny, there, there's no doubt, not any really obvious dilatation of the central canal here. Mm -hmm. So so this is another case of rheumatoid arthritis. I just, the reason I've shown a bunch of cases of the C12 is it's, once you see it and know to look for it, it's very easy to see. But most cases that I've seen in clinical practice of C12 disease were initially missed. Not because they're not obvious, it's just because if you're looking only for disc disease, you tend not to look at that level. So I'm just trying to impress people that you need to look at that level. Okay, so if we talk about spinal arthritis, we've talked about this before, really primarily in looking at the hands. Uh, there are a number of different classifications, and this is very fluid and is changing all the time, especially with a lot of the new serologic studies to try to differentiate the different inflammatory diseases, uh, and we've talked about, I think, syndesmophytes and things. So we've really talked about all these issues, uh, especially when we talked about the lumbar spine. Uh, yes. So, uh, let's see, Thomas, what do you think of this case? A young male with nonspecific dorsal spine pain. Uh, there's some increased signal at the uh, corners of the vertebral bodies, sort of throughout the thoracic and lumbar. So it has shiny anterior corners as well as posterior edges here, corners here. Right. Here. So, yeah, that would be some enthesitis, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And there the, we have a coronal where we can see this. So what disease do you think this is? Uh, so I think this could be like early ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah, this is a young male. Yeah, in my in my book, this probably isn't too early, uh, but but this is ankylosing spondylitis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and it's we don't know whether these levels are fused really on an MR scan because as we saw before, the, the syndesmophytes are, are black and they blend in with the black annulus. So this is a situation where you do need plain films to help round out the differential here. But generally is what I found is that ankylosing spondylitis typically starts more in the sacral region and the lumbar region, and it takes longer to get up higher here. And usually when it's up in the thoracic regions, that's not really early disease. We really like to pick it up uh, very early. And then here's, uh, uh, here we can see the same findings, I think we talked about this in, in previous lectures where you can see those. In this particular patient, looks a nice anterior longitudinal ligament, but then if you go to the x-rays, you can actually see that there's bridging syndesmophytes at all these levels, which is just very difficult to see on an MR exam. There's a little bit we can see there, but generally early on, especially at the time when you want to make a diagnosis, this patient, I, my guess is, is well after their teen years. You really want to pick up the diagnosis before you actually start getting marrow extending into the syndesmophyte. Yeah. And then here, other lesions that we can see in discitis, but this is very nonspecific. It can be seen in inflammatory diseases, but it's just too nonspecific to be diagnostically useful. This is by far most commonly seen in degenerative disc disease and not inflammatory disease. But that, that is, if you have a young person who has symptoms that really look like uh, a systemic inflammatory disease, and they have these discs that look like it's an old timer, then you have to be very concerned about an inflammatory condition, uh, such as ankylosing spondylitis. 
And then here's just a more of an end stage disease where you can see comp complete fusion of the sacroiliac joints. But I don't know. And then here we can see this is chronic long standing. Uh, th these are actually fused. Uh, vert this is a completely fused vertebral body. Hard to tell both posteriorly and anteriorly it's fused here. As is the sacrum and end stage uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Hopefully. And we think, and also with these diseases, you also can get the zygoapophyseal joints posteriorly, which we saw before too. Okay, uh, Sam. Forty-four-year-old woman, neck pain, left mid right. So the facets are, have a lot of edema. There's also edema in the surrounding tissues and in the vertebral bodies at these levels. I mean, it could be, yes, yeah, so, I mean, inflammatory arthropathy could look like this. And, and this turns out to be Crohn's disease. Okay. It's in the same category. Inflammatory bowel disease is in the same category that we're talking about in terms of the MR appearance of the inflammatory lesions in the spine. And then here's another case where we can see uh, edema in the posterior elements here putting us in the same category of diseases, and this is enthesitis um, in a patient with systemic inflammatory diseases. I forgot exactly which one this patient had. Okay. Can you explain the T1 changes in the vertebral body? Is there it's strange? Is the T1, you should um, see more fat, but there's like replacement of the fat, isn't it? in a weird kind of geographic... Yeah, I, th I think so what's happening here is this is hematopoietic marrow here, and these are areas where you've had inflammatory yeah. disease, yeah. and it's healed, and you've left yeah. with fatty marrow there. Thank you, same as like with the celiac joints. Yeah. Yep, yep. yep. Okay, 63-year-old woman, July 2001. So, doesn't look too bad. See some L5 S1 degenerative disc disease, probably. CMR. Okay, here it looks like there are multiple areas of uh, fatty replacement on the T1 sequence. And. Fat replacement? It looks oh, like. Yeah, oh, I see. You mean yeah, the, replacement the, of the fat. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. sorry. Uh. And similarly, that corresponds with areas of hyper-intense signal on the T2. So this is where the T2 is probably post-contrast. Yeah, so kind of fill in with I think they're enhancing a little bit. Again, replacement of the fat here. And in, it looks like there's enhancement. Uh, 2003, okay, now it looks like those areas are sclerotic. Sort of patchy sclerosis all over the place. We saw a similar case like this earlier. I think of, it was Sappho. Yeah. I want to look at the the uh, sternoclavicular joint. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so uh, two sagittal fat set. Right. Okay, T2, uh, extensive abnormal signal within the spinal cord with some cystic areas. So, on post contrast, there is enhancement. Wow. Um, patchy enhancement within the spinal cord and extensive soft tissue. I mean, posterior elements, the refusion of those. Well, the, you can see there's been a big laminectomy. Right. Surgical. So they went and operated on this. So it's the back again. So this is what they're looking at. What's your differential here? What would make you go and do surgery? Mm. They, 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 they thought this, might, this was your tumor. Yeah, that's so why there is surgery. Now we're getting a lot of cord atrophy, a lot of that. 
substance of the cord and C-rings, I guess, right? The higher up is, is those the T1 in, the enhancing stuff is the time So the inflammatory lesions probably produce some degree of obstruction, and they thought that might be tumor, but it all turned out to be sarcoidosis. Okay, Sahar? Thirty-five-year-old female, chest and neck pain. There is some thing edema in the like C six vertebral body and maybe lower I guess C two also and some enhancement also involving the posterior elements. Maybe some edema also in the prevertebral soft tissues. Okay, now. The same thing, some of the one enhancement. You know, like inflammatory arthropathy. So this is 122809. 122809. Mm -hmm. This is 222 2010. A couple of months later. Okay, still we see that edema enhancement in the vertebral bodies and posterior elements. Okay, same appearance. Okay. Is it a fluid collection or it's just the very odd? Okay, and again, so we have all this inflammatory tissue out through here. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it's involving the vertebral bodies as well as the posterior elements. And it's another case mm -hmm. of sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. And here's a chest x-ray. Okay, yeah, there's a little bit of mouth there. There you go. Big notes. So skeletal involvement is relatively uncommon, but common enough to be concerned about it. Typically present with a joint disease. You can also have the bones involved as well as the muscles. Typically, as you're most familiar with, or the lace-like uh, pattern that you see in the small bones of the hand. You probably see it in the small bones of the hand because they're small. It's probably happening elsewhere in the body, but the bones are larger and you can't see it because it, there's too much overlap uh, in a projection-type technique. And then you just see these kind of rounded medullary inflammatory lesions within the bone when you have sarcoid with it. And then we just saw a case of myelopathy where it could also involve the, the cord and neurologic structures. Here's muscle involvement. Here, here's the involvement around the, the spine that we saw before. Yeah. Okay. See, so hard to that one, right? So, Thomas, what do you think of this one? Uh, Fifty-year-old female, back pain, ANCA-associated vasculitis, and uh, looks like there's a structure in the anterior spinal canal. Uh, right, it's facing the CSF, and it looks like it's diffuse enhancement on post-contrast images. And right, so it's uh, I think that's demonstrating extensive enhancement, sort of effacing the fecal sac. And with a history of vasculitis, uh, I suspect some kind of vascular yeah. anomaly. Uh, this turned out to be Wegner's granulomatosis. <laughs> that's all okay. granulation tissue. It's all granulation tissue, right? Okay. Yeah, there was an FTG uptake. It's inflammatory. Yeah. 
So, 37-year-old neurologic deficits after viral syndrome, question of cord lesion. Um, there's a STIR or a T2 or STIR, maybe. and then no, they're all STIRs. So there's a lot of signal in the cord. Yeah, kind of diffuse. And no discrete, like, focal lesion. I don't really see anything to account for. A lot of signal. So neurologic... Um, I wonder, I mean, if it's starting distally, uh, well, it's just the cord, right? It's not like a peripheral, I don't know. Um, I think Guillain-Barre would, would affect like the, the roots, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, they're all viral. 69 year old woman presents with acute onset upper neck pain radiating to eye and occipital skull no history of trauma or infection okay so it looks like there's sort of this heterogeneous curvilinear hypo intense stuff anterior to the dens with a lot of adjacent inflammation and edema uh, so it could be calcification of the longus coli, hydroxyapatite deposition. one year old radiologist with two day history, severe left sided neck pain, muscle spasm and difficulty swelling. Okay, so sagittal and uh, two axial images. Uh, some disc uh, disease and fluid. Right, some fluid in yeah anteriorly there too so it's anterior longitudinal ligament yeah there is a ossification of one of the ligament there La longus collie yeah so it's basically the same disease Finding and right. Okay, we got a lateral view of the neck. Um, pretty much, maybe some degenerative changes. C2 looks okay, C1, C2, they look okay. Mm. So, so, so a little bit of disk space narrowing down here. Yeah. So, what about the soft tissues? So maybe there's some, yeah, retroperitoneal, like perivertebral soft tissue thickening. Yeah, yeah but a lot of soft tissue thickening, thickening here. Uh, there's a kind of a blow up of the area. Maybe there's a focal calcification there, or is it just overlap? The history here is difficulty swallowings beginning four days ago. You can see a lot okay. of calcification around here. Here, a lot of soft tissue thickening. Here's mm -hmm. the CT. Okay, we see that calcification in the CT under like retropharyngeal fluid along the uh, longus colloidal muscles. It's probably another calcification of the longus colloidal muscles. And here's the MR showing a lot of inflammatory changes. Edema, all this soft tissue thickening, and we can see the area of calcification mm -hmm. here. <laughs> so, again, it's calcific tendinosis of the, of the longus coli. Okay, uh, Thomas, what do you think of this case? 
to the sagittal T2. So, so this is a patient who was treated for, uh, I believe it was uh, back in leg pain, and they, they put in a catheter. And now the patient's coming back with increasing pain. Uh, like a spinal catheter for? Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's a focus of low signal intensity in the spinal canal. Yeah, right there. Yeah, that's uh, part of the catheter. The other thing is that they're having trouble in choosing the pain meds. That's what we see there. And they hear the axle. So, yeah, I guess there could be some like dystrophic calcifications associated with the uh, catheter. I don't know if there's calcification here. And then we can follow the catheter going down. This was a granuloma that can form on the catheter. It obstructs the end of the catheter. And then it's, uh, uh, it's, it no longer functions properly. Sometimes you have to replace the catheter if they, if they need it. So this is a, a granuloma on the head of the catheter. So they, they actually took this one out and put in a new one. OK. So why don't we talk a little bit about trauma here. Uh, in the cervical spine. Actually, uh, let me quit here, and then uh, why don't everybody just log back in so that I have this as a separate uh, lecture.